The rocket used 90% hydrogen peroxide decomposed by a potassium permanganate catalyst. Here we are machining the stainless steel nozzle for the thrust chamber. There's the potassium permanganate catalyst uh, being put into the thrust chamber and there's the nozzle going on. The catalyst was contained between uh, a pair of screens. And in Mint Canyon we get ready for our first static test. For this test, we simply pressurize the hydrogen peroxide tank directly from a cylinder of nitrogen. The data consists of a 16 millimeter camera photographing a board with pressure gauges and a stopwatch. quarter-inch copper line brought over the top of the hill to provide the nitrogen pressurization and another line brought on over for the uh, another pair of lines for the chamber pressure and the peroxide tank pressure. There's the drum of 90 percent hydrogen peroxide. Give it a little pressure, start it siphoning into a glass graduate and then pour it through a funnel into the peroxide tank which consisted of a breathing oxygen tank from the surplus store. And we simply turn on the nitrogen pressure to a couple of hundred psi. There's no flame from the decomposition of the peroxide, it just kicks up a lot of dirt and dust. Here's the second test. The exhaust is deflected by a uh, 45 degree baffle below the, th the uh, nozzle. Kicks up a lot of rocks. The valve to turn on the nitrogen flow consisted of a spring-loaded valve with a solid propellant capsule. When the capsule burned, it let the valve open back in Mint Canyon. There's Lee Rosenthal, the, uh, the fellow on the right, I don't remember his name, that's uh, Walter Rosenthal, Lee Rosenthal's father on the left. Here are the solid propellant capsules burning and letting the nitrogen valve open. Now we have flow of peroxide through the thrust chamber and the pressure slowly decays as the nitrogen pressure drops off in the uh, nitrogen tank. Nozzle turns blue from the heat of the combustion or the heat of the decomposition. Now we're ready to add three magnesium fins to the shell, to the uh, combustion chamber rather. Here we're machining the uh, taper on the magnesium fins. This is in the mechanical engineering shop at Caltech. Bolting the fins in place directly to the thrust chamber. Adding a spun aluminum tail cone. Here I am laying out the 20 mil thick aluminum shell, fairing to go over the tanks. roll the shell into a cylinder and later we glued the seam with plyobond 
And finally we had a spun aluminum nose cone with a machined tip. Then we built a 40-foot launching tower with three guide rails inside. Here's my 1939 Buick that we used to tow it out to the Pacific Rocket Society's test area. The two 20-foot tower sections bolt in the middle. There's Bob DeVoe pulling on the hoist chain. That's Dudley Neff on the left. Carol Evans was in that picture, too. There's Bob DeVoe again. Lee Rosenthal attaching the guy wires. Now we're ready for a final static test with the rocket secured part way up the tower. It was fortunate we did this because, as you'll see, when the solid propellant capsule burned to let the nitrogen valve open, the escaping gas split the shell seam open, which would have been disastrous on a flight. There you see the seam pop open. We later added three exhaust tubes to duct the exhaust gas directly to the outside and not put any pressure inside the shell. Otherwise, this is a successful test. The rocket motor is running and kicking up dust. This is a micrograin rocket test. Micrograin rocket using one of the leftover tubes from the 1948 rocket mail flight. We built a nice tracking theodolite, as you can see here, with a telephoto lens and a camera. The micrograin rocket takes off in the usual hurry, and the smoke flare in the nose makes a track through the sky. the front half of the rocket buried in the ground. This is uh, on the lawn of the Athenaeum at uh, Caltech, putting the rocket out for people to admire. There's Lee Rosenthal you can see some pads on the outside of the shell that were the uh, pads that slid along the launching tower rails. One pair of pads is slotted, as you see there, to keep the rocket from turning in the tower. Finally, the big day dawns. There's Lee Rosenthal with a nitrogen cylinder connected up to pressurize the flight nitrogen tank. Below, you see the nitrogen valve with the three exhaust stacks on it. lowering the aluminum shell over the tanks.
The rocket had a solid propellant smoke flare in the nose with some holes for the smoke to come out of. But unfortunately on the flight the smoke flare didn't ignite properly and we didn't get the smoke trail that we had counted on to let us see where the rocket went. These are the ignition wires to the smoke flare. A breezy morning. Tracking station ready a mile away. Countdown begins. Ready with the tracking telescope. Ignition, lift off. The rocket veers about 10 degrees off vertical, disappears into the blue, never to be seen again. Based on where it was last seen going from the tracking camera and calculations of the performance, we estimated that it reached an altitude of four and a half miles. And proceeding westbound, north of Soledad Mountain, to an estimated distance of 7.7 .7 miles. We searched for it that day and sub subsequent days, but uh, never found it.